Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Good morning, everyone. So, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah, ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. All praise and gratitude belongs to Allah. Uh, and we send praise and peace upon his messenger and his noble companions. I'd like to start uh, today by just giving you some introductory comments so that the, the groundwork for today's conversation is laid. My profession, as was mentioned, I am a teacher, and uh, the, I consider the primary difference between a teacher and a speaker the following. A teacher likes to engage in conversation, while a uh, speaker may be very professional at putting people to sleep. So. I'm going to try to act like a teacher today. In other words, I'm going to try to spark as much conversation as possible. There are quite a few ideas I do want to share with all of you today and maybe perhaps present a perspective that you may not have heard before. And that's really going to be the core of my attempt. Uh, stuff that you could have read in a textbook or Googled and things like that, I'll probably go through it kind of quickly. And things that I think are unique perspectives that you might not get a chance to hear unless you come to a place like this, those are the things I'm going to try to highlight more so. Okay. Now, you may have questions, and I'm sure you do, that have nothing to do with that, what I talk about, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, and you may have already come here with a bunch of questions of your own. And I do encourage those kinds of questions, but I'd like to keep at least this conversation focused to what I'm sort of dictating. And in our breaks, in our breakout sessions, and especially the QA, dedicated QA session, feel free to ask whatever uh, you like. I don't claim to have the answer to any of your questions, uh, what I can say is, hopefully I do have some, I can point you in the right direction for some of them, and perhaps if I can answer them, I will myself. Okay, so th that's basically a little bit of an introductory um, orientation. Now let's talk about what my subject matter today is going to be. Basically in this hour or less in this conversation, I have to share with you what Islam is about. And, you know, how to think about Islam. And what I ask all of you to do is to put your preconceived notions, and all of us have them, about everything, aside. Just pretend that you, you're, you know, like it was, you know, attempted that we're on a flight or something. You know, where you're sitting on a plane next to you, this guy, and you look at his like Abe Lincoln beard, and you say, "Hey, so what's that about?" And it's not Halloween, so what is that real? And then you say, and, and I say, "Okay, well, I'm Muslim. What's that? Never heard of it. Apparently, you don't have CNN, but still." <laughs> so we're having that kind of a conversation. Just let me just tell you some stuff about Islam, okay? And if somebody wants to know about Islam, the first thing they want to know about, or they should know about from a Muslim perspective, what's the priority? Well, what's our faith? And our faith starts with faith in God. So I'll talk a little bit about faith in God himself and what Muslims believe about God. The term God, the closest thing to it in the Arabic language is the word ilah. That's a sacred term. It's used in the declaration of Muslim faith. When somebody converts to Islam or accepts Islam, then they say this phrase, this, this Arabic phrase, la ilaha illallah, in which there's the term ilah. If you want to write that in English, it would be I-L-A-A-H, ilah. It's pronounced pretty easy to pronounce in English, okay? That's the generic term, you would say, closest to the word God in the English language. Now, the word ilah is pretty rich in Arabic because it means a few things. It means an entity that's worthy of worship, a deity. It also means the object of devotion and love. Uh, it actually also means someone you turn to in desperate times. Uh, it's all, it also means someone you are passionately in love with and can't stop thinking about. There are a ter there's a slew of meaning that comes from the word ilah. And ilah literally also means the thing you lean on, what you lean on. In other words, when you're exhausted, you lean. So what you lean on is God. Now, for a lot of people who don't know that, they ask, well, you know, we believe, or someone from another faith tradition might say, we believe God is love. Do you guys believe that? Well, actually, that's already embedded in the, the word ilah as we have it in the Arabic language. So oftentimes in translation, it's not put that way for oversimplification purposes. We just say God. But the word God in the Arabic language, and as it's used in sacred text, is so rich that if we tried to do that for every word of the Arabic language, we wouldn't actually get a translation. We'd get like eight synonyms per word, and then move on to and, and then eight synonyms. It just wouldn't be functional language anymore. So that sort of thing can only come out in discussion and conversation, not really in translation. So we call him Allah. His name is Allah. That would be spelled in English A-L-L-A-H, an emphasis on the L, okay, Allah. And we don't consider, there, this difference of opinion among our scholars about what the word means. Some say it's the original name of God, true to God in all previous scripture as well. Interestingly enough, the Arab Christian tradition, which predates the Muslim tradition of Arabia, uh, has been using the word Allah for God much before Muslims have. 
So, for example, you, to this day, you will find, for example, Christians in Egypt, you'll find Christians in Lebanon, Palestine, other places, and their biblical tradition is actually pretty old. As a matter of fact, our prophet even met Christians uh, in the city of Najran at one point and had interchange with them and discussions with them. And actually, they as well use the word Allah for God. So it's actually an ancient term for God across cultures. It's not even something limited to Islam. That's the first, uh, or one of the things I wanted to highlight when we talk about the word Allah. Now, what do we believe about this Allah? First of all, we believe that He's one. He's unique. He can't be compared to anything. That there can't be any imagery or, or, or something that kind of limits the imagination to what He might look like or what He might be like. We also believe that he has perfect attributes. In other words, if, his, if he hears, he's, his hearing is perfect, it's limitless, it's infinite, and it has no beginning and no end. His vision is the same, his wisdom is the same, his knowledge is the same, his power is the same, his mercy is the same, his love is the same. So we attribute three things to every quality of God. So I'd like to highlight those three things so everybody's clear about them. The first of them is that they have no beginning and no end. That God's, like my hearing has a beginning and an end, but God's doesn't, Allah's doesn't. It has no beginning and no end. The second of them is that it's infinite. That mine, for instance, if someone's talking on the other side of this wall, I can't hear, but God's is infinite. It's not, Allah's is infinite, it's unlimited. And the third is that mine, my hearing or my seeing or any of my attributes for, for that matter, are granted. In other words, I don't own my hearing, it was given to me. It was, it was gift granted. My seeing was a gift granted. But his is his own originally. In other words, all other things are granted their qualities from him. They are a grant from him, but his are actually originally his own. So just to see if you're still awake out there somewhere in the wilderness, what are those three things that make God's qualities unique? No beginning, no end. Good, that's one. I'll wait. I'll make this awkward. I love making things awkward. That's what I do. Huh? It's infinite, sure. Third? Yep, originally his own. Originally his own, not given to him by anyone else. Right? So this solves a big theological problem for Muslims because we say things like a teacher is wise, and we also say God is wise. We say something like, you know, a mother is loving. We also say God is loving. We will say things like, you know, uh, this car is powerful. We'll use the same attribute, powerful, for God. God is powerful. Well, how do we distinguish? Because the language, unfortunately, shares the word with us, with creation, and with God. Well, you keep these three distinctions in mind, and you won't fall into trouble. And what do I mean by falling into trouble is my next point. In any of these attributes of God, first of all, his oneness, his uniqueness, and in any of his other attributes, if the Muslim says that I attribute that sort of perfection in any way to anything else, then I'm committing the highest crime there is, blasphemy. That to me, that to the Muslim is blasphemous. You don't attribute that sort of perfection and that sort of limitless power in any way, shape, or form to anybody else except Allah Himself. No one else gets that. Everyone else that, for example, life, the living. So God's life is infinite, it has no beginning and no end, and it's His own. My life, however, is finite, it has a beginning and an end, and as a matter of fact, it was given to me. Right? So if I, if I uh, uh, attribute eternal life to someone else, that has no beginning and no end, or something like that, then, then I've con con considered the act of blasphemy. Now, we don't use the word blasphemy in, in, in Muslim tradition much. Even Muslims from different cultures uh, use the same Arabic word. And that's another tangential point, but only 18% of Muslims on the planet are Arabs. 82% or more, roughly, are non-Arabs. So this is a religion that spans Europe, Southeast Asia, Asia, the Africas, Obviously, there's a significant population in the West, here in the United States also, Australia. There's about a million Muslims in Australia. It's a global phenomenon. And it's not even an ethnic phenomenon. It's not limited to one ethnicity. And for many, many, many centuries, well over a millennium, the majority has been non-Arab. So even though it started in Arabia, the majority of the people that carry the religion, with no political ties to Arabia even, have actually been non-Arabs. Okay? So we, this, this act of blasphemy, of attributing something that equates something else to God, is called shirk. Uh, I'll spell that out for you too, S-H-I-R-K. So nothing worse for a Muslim, from his faith perspective, nothing worse than shirk. S-H-I-R-K. Sounds like Shrek, so that's easy to remember, right? <laughs> nothing worse than Shrek for Muslims. <laughs> That'd be confusing. But anyway, so that's the, that's the first thing about God. You know, his perfection in every possible way, 
and how we're not supposed to be doing shit. But that still doesn't answer a very important question. What do Muslims think God wants from them? What do they think God wants? What is, what's their purpose in life? Why, why do you put them here on the earth? You know, what are they doing here? So a few, a few things that I want to highlight that again, I think are unique perspectives. Some of these things you might already know, some you may not. So I'm going to just kind of bullet list them and so you have kind of a concise you know, view of how we see things in our faith tradition between, as far as our relationship with God is concerned. The first of them is our purpose in life. Our purpose in life is to find God in ourselves and to engage in a continuous struggle to submit to His will. To accept the fact that we were brought on, uh, on this earth and the greatest joy we will ever find is to actually be in servitude to Him. If we can find that willingly ourselves, then we have found our purpose in life. Willing, consensual servitude to God in, all, in, in, in any respect He wants. Now, when we say someone completely submits to someone else, or someone's completely under somebody else's will, then in the social sense, we actually consider that a form of slavery. In any other context, to take God out of the picture, when someone is in complete submission to somebody else's will, they do what somebody else says, regardless of what area of life. You know, in, in our jobs, there's at least a job description. Right? So if you're an accountant, sorry to pick on accountants, then you're only working at a certain number of hours, and you're not going to be asked to mop the floor unless the economy is really bad. You know, you're, you're going to be, you're, there's a particular set of things you're supposed to do. Beyond that, if you're told to do them, you say, oh, that's not my job. I'm just an accountant, right? But when you're in absolute submission to another entity's will, in other words, you're in slavery, well, a slave owner can tell, turn to the slave and say what? Mop the floor, do the accounting, wash the windows while you're at it, do my laundry, whatever. He cannot, he cannot be told, well, that's beyond my job description, right? And obviously, I'm using the term slavery, and it has negative connotations. But I want you to understand something. That in, the, in one sense, we do actually proudly accept willing slavery to God as Muslims. We actually call ourselves abd in Arabic, literally meaning slave. There's no, I can't give you a politically correct translation, that's what it is. Now, abd literally means in Arabic, slave. And that is actually the, the call of God to us, accept, accept yourselves as slaves of mine. Now the, the difference though is slavery, let's just compare slavery in every other context and slavery in the Muslim context to God. Slavery is willing or unwilling? Does someone enter into slavery willingly or unwillingly? Unwillingly. It's, it's never like, hey, I'm in a, you know, I have, I've exhausted all other career paths, so might as well. No, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. Never has, never will. Islam, our slavery to God is already unique because he's saying, فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ By the way, whenever I quote something in Arabic, I'll translate immediately. Whoever wants, they can come and believe. Whoever wants, they can walk away. It's your choice. So it's already different because it's willing. Second, a slave would have to be a slave in every matter of life. Right? Everything he does is up to the master's whim. God basically says, it's very beautiful in Islamic literature, the, the Qur'an says, وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Which actually says, they do the few good things expected of them. In other words, God didn't make a long, endless list of stuff you gotta do. There's a very short list of do's and don'ts. Take care of this, and you live your life. Take care of this, and everything else, you do however you do it. And even those few things, they're actually very, very few. There are very, very few restrictions, and there are very, very few obligations. You meet those, and you're in the clear. Other than that, enjoy life. Do whatever else you want. And even in those few restrictions, what God continuously explains is, He only put them there because not putting them there will put you in harm's way. Our scholars traditionally explain God's restrictions like medication for a sick child. Which child? I have six kids myself. Yeah, seriously, six. Um, what child ever likes to take medication? I mean, honestly. But is it necessary? Yeah, and it's painful sometimes too. And the, and the mother is forcing cough medicine down her son's throat, and he's yelling and screaming, and he's saying, I hate you, mom, I can't believe you're doing this to me, why would you do this to me, etc. But you know, at the end of all of it, that is an act of love from a mother. That's an act of, it's a painful act of love, but it's still an act of love, because she knows something the child doesn't. She understands something the child doesn't. And in some sense, some of the restrictions of Islam are explained in that way. In other words, عَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحِبُّ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ شَرٌ لَكُمْ God says, maybe you hate something, but it's good for you. Maybe you really like something, but it's no good for you. 
Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun. Allah knows and you don't. Just trust me. So it's not a long list of prohibitions, it's a short list. And outside of that, you're free to live your life. Now, so that's the first thing. The second thing about us and God is that he created two lives for us. There are two lives. There's a life of this world, and there's a life in the afterlife. We believe in an afterlife, heaven and hell, day of judgment. All of our deeds will be presented before God, and people are going to be begging for God's forgiveness. And nobody's actually making it to heaven in Muslim creed unless through God's love and forgiveness. Our deeds alone aren't enough. That's unanimous Muslim creed. Nobody, nobody disagrees with this point. The Prophet was explicit in saying this. In other words, we can do all the good we want in the world, it's still not enough. It's going to have to be God's mercy and love at the end that saves us. It's always been this way. This is not a new idea I'm presenting to you. But regardless, there are two lives. One that we live here, and one that we live there. What's important to note in Islamic tradition is that God expects us to beautify and build both homes. He expects us, that this is unique, you might not have heard this before. God actually expects us to build both homes. As a matter of fact, like yesterday's Friday sermon that I had to do in Plano, I was explaining one singular verse of the Qur'an, in which the, fir, the terminology uses, وَاسْتَعْمَرَكُمْ فِيهَا He wanted you to build on the earth. He wanted you to build. And isti'mar is used in Arabic when you build something that lasts a long time, and while you're building it, you don't end up destroying other things. In other words, you build what you call, we would call in the modern sense, sustainable societies, eco-friendly societies. Societies in which the few that are become, you know, building major corporations and cities are not doing so at the expense of others that are being economically manipulated. Right? So the idea of building something that anybody can benefit from. Right? And so God goes out of His way in the Qur'an on countless occasions. It's really hard to put a count on this. To describe how beautiful the earth is. To describe how gorgeous mountains are, how, what, a, what a joy rivers are, what a great thing even. I mean, the, the, desert, the desert Arabs didn't have a lot of that stuff. So he'd even talk about camels and how awesome they are. And the stars. Because, I mean, they really didn't have much else to look at, right? So at least the stars are pretty cool. So he'd talk about the stars. Even you will have, you can find beauty too. Even you can find beauty, you know. And so you talk about these things to, to let us know that this, the life of this world, worldly existence, is not a curse. We're not damned here. We're blessed here. We're blessed here. Just stay away from these few restrictions, abide by these few regulation, regulations, and this world is beautiful. And your job is to make it beautiful and build it. And now, of course, when you build something, when you ask your child, I ask my child, hey, build me a castle. He says, buy me the Legos first. You can't build something until you have the ingredients, right? So he says, وَجَعَلَ فِيهَا أَقْوَاتَهَا in the Qur'an. He put in the earth all of its inherent powers. In other words, all you will need to make this world a beautiful place for yourself and others has been put in this earth. And we, human civilization has been here for a, quite a long time and we've had resources enough for everybody. Now it may not seem that way because of the varying economic situations of many countries, right? And economies and the first world, second world, and third world and all of that, right? But the fa the, from the faith perspective, we believe actually there are enough resources for all human beings to live well on this earth and live in a, in a healthy and a fair way. Okay, so that's our faith perspective on life in this world. You don't choose the next life for this life. You don't abandon the concern for the next life for this life. Either you balance both of them. In other words, we live a spiritual existence while being involved you know, greatly in this world at the same time. So there's nothing materialistic for a Muslim in, for example, running a multi-million dollar business. There's nothing wrong with that. However, there is something wrong if that's his goal. So that's the other subtle point. So you can engage in this world, but it can't be your goal. Your goal is higher. Your goal is to do something that benefits others. And your goal is, to, if you really want to build a home, your goal is to build your real home in heaven. And so all that you do here is only a means to get there. Okay, so do a good job and enjoy it while you're doing it here, but make sure you're building your next life. And how do you, what's the easiest way to build your next life? This is another important Islamic concept. It, it's the concept of what's called sadaqa jariya, continuous charity. Now what does that mean, continuous charity? It actually means if I leave a good legacy behind, I'm only going to live so many years. I'm, I don't know how long I'm going to live. If I can do some acts of good that actually live longer than I do. For instance, I go to a, you know, a, a, a desperate location where education, for example, is a desperate need and there aren't any resources. And I help set up a school. 
let's just say hypothetically speaking, I help set up a school. And the school takes off and now you know, children are getting a good education and they're building a better and better society for, their, you know, for the next generation. And this school takes off and it goes on, it's, it's now 200 years old. I left the world a long time ago. But every student who graduates from that school and does something good in life, I have a share in. I get commission out of that. That's called continuous charity. The Muslims are supposed to build their afterlife, not just through good works of their own, but to create, uh, to invest in opportunities of continual good. Continual, and that's how we see preparing for ourselves for the next life. Like my motivation to teach, for instance, I was not originally a teacher, I wasn't even a public speaker. I was a nervous wreck when I had to speak in front of people. But this, this last month I had to speak, I had to give a sermon in front of 15,000 people in Malaysia. <laughs> That was pretty nerve-wracking. But I, I, I've pushed myself in this direction, and my teachers did also. And one of the most motivating instructions or, or teachings from our religion that pushed me in this direction was a saying of our Prophet, which, in which he said, The best of you are the ones who learn the Qur'an and teach it. The best people are the ones who learn this book of inspiration and give this inspiration to others. So they can do awesome stuff. That's what I've been doing for the last, I don't know, 12, 15 years. I lost count. That's what I've been doing. I also feel in, in our next session, not this session, but in our next session, I'm going to talk to you about how I believe the Qur'an, one of the most popular books on the planet, like it or not, most popular book on the planet, most well-read by many statisticians, and if not the top, then up there, even if you disagree with the statistics, is actually one of the most misunderstood texts in world history one of the most misunderstood and underestimated, overlooked, by Muslims and non-Muslims. And I'm going to highlight some of that stuff to you in our next session. Like, what, what do I mean the Qur'an gets overlooked? Or some things in it, just people don't even know what's there. Right? So we'll talk about that in the next session. Anyway, coming back to God's expectations from us. The first one was just a few, few restrictions. Don't do blasphemy. That's one expectation from God, right? The second one is build a good home here so you can build a good home there. And how do you build a good home here? By making sure you do things that benefit not just yourself, but others. This, this, this is a fundamental concept in Islam. As a matter of fact, it's a really beautiful uh, uh, tradition in our history where you know, we believe that you know, there are sayings of the Prophet about the end of times and when there's going to be great war and catastrophe. The biblical you know, version of that is the Armageddon and all of that sort of thing. Right? It's a major, major catas catastrophic events happening in the world. And the Prophet said, when the Antichrist shows up, and we believe in the Antichrist too, when he shows up and one of you is busy planting a seed, now the companions of the Prophet are sitting there listening, the Antichrist has just shown up. The, you know, the devil manifest. It's come out, great war is coming. And you were just busy in your backyard doing what? Planting a seed. What should you do? Drop it and run? He goes, no, finish planting the seed. He said, finish planting the seed. Now what does he mean by that? He means don't be overwhelmed by world events. Things are looking pretty bad in the news. And they're going to look worse and worse and worse. And you're going to think, what is my insignificant good deed going to matter? Who's going to benefit from that? Don't underestimate the power of good. Just do it. And you may not even live to see that tree. You may not even live to see it. But the fact that one day that tree might grow, and somebody might sh sit in its shade. Somebody else might eat from its fruit. Somebody else might take from that fruit and take one of its seed and plant another tree somewhere else. You don't know how this will benefit others, and therefore yourself in the afterlife. So don't underestimate it. Right? So we, don't, we, we value all good things, and we don't get overwhelmed by the negative forces around us. The negative forces in the media around us. Like, you know, for a lot of Muslims, they get overwhelmed. Muslims are getting bashed in the media all the time. I'll give you a crazy perspective. So I went to Qatar in the Gulf states. Some of you might know where that is. Uh, so I went to Qatar recently, and I was talking to Qatar TV. And they have this weird impression of what life must be like for Muslims in America. Because the only thing they have in the news uh, from America about Islam is, you know, let's burn a Qur'an, or, you know, somebody flushed it down a toilet, or, you know, Guantanamo Bay, or whatever. They have these weird, just, it's all they have. They have no other image of what Muslims are like in America. So, I'm sitting with this anchor, a TV anchor, who's a British man himself, and he's like, so, life for you lot. You've got concentration camps, do you? 
And I was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? It must be really hard being Muslim in, in America. I was like, I live in Texas. <gasps> it, was <just> like, <laughs> it was just like, they let you? <laughs> I, had a, I had a great kick out of that. You know what's crazy? To them, I'm actually an ambassador of the United States. I have to tell them what life is like in America. Go figure. I have to tell them, no, it's great here. What are you kidding me? We have some of the best mosques and some of the most flourishing Islamic communities and youth groups and educational programs and good relations with churches in our neighborhood. And we got a lot of good stuff going on. But don't they hate you? It's like, some people might, but they don't really show up much. You know, people are curious. People want to know. People would like to hear, and I, and I respect those of you that came here. I, I don't think it's easy. I don't, if, I heard, if I only knew about Islam from what, listening to the radio, if I only knew about, oh my God. If I knew there was a mosque in my neighborhood, oh, I'd move. <laughs> That's terrifying. So the fact that you're here to me is an act of bravery, honestly. But at the same time, I think there needs to be more acts of bravery. Oh, it's okay, baby. Okay. It happens. Well, I'll wait, I'll wait. It's too distracting. It's okay. So what I was going to say, you know, I, I stop and give kind of moms their due because my kids do that all the time in the middle of my speeches. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all good. What was I talking about, though? God, I forgot. Bravery. Ah, Bravery. Bravery. You know, I learned something, and, and I, I recently started traveling, like internationally. I've been traveling across the U.S. for a long time. But one of the things that I've learned, and it's been a real life lesson, and it, you know, it sounds cliche, but it's a true life lesson. It's so, he, so easy to dehumanize people and to simplify what they're all about without ever talking to them. It's so easy. It's, I mean, for God's sake, you could just say, oh, all of them are like, and you can fill in the blanks yourself. They all must be like, and fill in the blanks yourself. Because you, because you and I haven't actually made, in my opinion, enough of an effort to actually make connections, to make real connections, to talk, and to talk in a civil way. You know what, a lot of times what you see on talk radio, or what you listen, or, or, or you hear on talk radio, or see on TV, that's not how normal people talk. That kind of overly aggressive, I'm going to shove this in your face, I'm going to put you down, I'm going to show people how evil you are. That, that's not how normal people engage in conversation. So a lot of times we hear so much of that, we figure the only time we're going to talk to the other is going to, we're going to talk in that way. Right? <laughs> that's not healthy. It's not normal. You know? We want to be able to have normal conversations. And we should be able to have perfectly fine disagreements. I'll tell you a really cool story from last week. A person I don't know came to me from McKinney. You guys know where McKinney is? It's almost Mexico. No, I'm kidding. But, I was like, but he came from McKinney. He drove all the way from McKinney to my office in Irving. He wanted to see me. He says, I've seen your YouTube videos. I wanted to talk to you. He sat me down. We're sitting down talking. He goes, well, you know, I became Muslim about 10 years ago. And that's around the same time that my wife, who was Muslim, converted to Christianity. We, were, we hadn't met each other yet. So they met each other in college. And they got married. And around like five months after, he became a Muslim from Christianity, and she became a Christian from Islam. <laughs> and they got married. Okay? And they have, you know, three kids, and they're living together, and he's very devout in his Islam, and she's very devout in her Christianity. I mean, her dad went on to become a pastor, and you know, her brother's becoming one too, and they're very devout in their Christianity. And they talk about their faith all the time, but they never fight. They talk about their faith all the time, and their disagreements. And their disagreements, but they never fight. And he, as a matter of fact, for the last 10 years have, has been going to church with her. He doesn't join the worship service, the prayer service. He'll listen to the sermon every single week. Everybody at the church knows the guy. Everybody. You know? And I hear that and I say, man, people need to know about people like you. Because we, we think that these conversations in a civil way, in a friendly way, can't exist. Much less to imagine that they exist in a civil way, inside one, one loving household. <laughs> That's crazy. That's unheard of to me, but it's happening. There are real people that are having those conversations. So if, if that can happen inside one family without conflict, it can certainly happen in our communities, right? Now coming back to Islam itself, sorry, perspective, you know, I figure. 
drop it on you guys. That's a really old iPhone ringtone, by the way. It's t time to. <laughs> it's really time to update that. Um, that's when the first one came out. Seriously. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> so, this world is. I, I mentioned already. This world is not a punishment. It's a place to live a wonderful life, right? وَجَعَلْنَا لَكُمْ فِيهَا مَعَايِشْ The Qur'an says we put means in here to, for you to live well. I already mentioned that to you. Now a little bit about Muslims d uh, discussing with people of other faiths. What does God tell us about how we should interact with people of other faiths? This is again, I think, going to be a unique perspective. I think. I don't think, I, I didn't hear it enough. Not from others. So I, I have to share this with you. So there are two, there are two perspectives in Revelation. When I read Revelation, I am a servant of God trying to understand His Word. Much like a Christian would try to understand the Bible. Much like a Jew would try to understand the Torah or the Talmud, etc. Much like that, a Muslim is trying to read the Qur'an and understand God's words to him. He's coming to the book as a humble student. As, a, as thirsty for wisdom. Thirsty for guidance. That's why we come to sacred text. Okay. God, however, doesn't have to be humble. God's not humble. God's all-powerful. We have to be humble. God's the authority. He can speak how He wants. And He speaks from a position of authority. I mean, look at a courtroom, for example. The judge doesn't speak in a humble way. Who does? The, the guy standing at the guy taking the testimony at the stand, you understand? Like, he's in a position of judging and authority. He's not going to tone it down. I've been watching Judge Judy since high school. <laughs> she doesn't tone anything down. You, be quiet. Now the thing is, I'm going to give you this crazy example before I go, turn to the Qur'an itself to help you understand this perspective. How many kids do I have pop quiz? Six. Very good. Okay. Six kids. One of them got in trouble. And I say, come here, young lady. How come you didn't show me your report card? What's that about? How come your teacher had to call me and tell me? How come? I'm, I'm, tell, I'm talking to her. And she's standing there. I'm so sorry. And then my other daughter walks in and goes, Yeah! <laughs> you should have shown it the first time, young lady. Now at that point, who's also in trouble? Excuse me? What did you become me? Who do you think you are? I speak from a position of authority. And just because she agrees with me or I, you know, she's my daughter, we have a relationship, does not grant her the same what? Authority. It doesn't. Revelation speaks from authority. The reader of Revelation is not granted that authority. You understand? Now let's talk about an example. God in the Quran finds, for instance, and I'm not going to wash it down for you, I'm just going to tell you like it is. God in the Quran, for instance, believe, or shares, teaches Muslims that attributing a son to God is, it angers him. It's beneath him. That having a child is a quality of creation, and those who say it are engaged in blasphemy. Oh my God, if I tell that to a Christian friend. It's in the Quran. I can even cite the verses for you, chapter 19, read the ending. Have fun. Now here's the thing, here's a story from the prophetic times. Just to put things in perspective. A group of Christians heard that a man in Arabia is claiming to be a prophet. Claims that the angel Gabriel came and gave him revelation. And it confirms previous scripture that was given to Moses and Jesus. And talks about all previous prophets that, are, you know, of notice. And especially Arab prophets that aren't even mentioned in the Bible. And says that it's a confirmation of all previous scripture and he's claiming that this revelation for all those who have previous scripture will find confirmation of their truth in it. So they say, let's check it out. So a group of learned Christians from a, on a place called Najran in Arabia travel to Medina where the Prophet was to meet with him and say, what are you talking about? We're Christians. We believe in revelation. What is this thing you call revelation? Let us see. Now they didn't have hotels back then. Those are some really squeaky chairs. Hold on, let the squeaky squeak, squeak, squeak sound and then I'll talk. Because this is a fun story, I don't want you to be distracted. Okay. So these Christians came, and they want to engage this, the Prophet and his claims in dialogue. They didn't have hotels back then. Guess where they stayed for the few weeks that they were in Medina? In the mosque. They were kept in the mosque. They were guests of the mosque. And they were to pray. 
because these are obviously people of religion, people of faith, so on a daily basis they are going to engage in their Christian acts of worship. Guess where they prayed? In the mosque. By the prophet's dictate. And guess who they prayed to? Jesus. Openly, out loud, the, the companions of the prophet hearing Jesus being prayed to where? Inside the mosque, inside the mosque. And the revelation itself says that when anyone says, Ar-Rahman, the most loving, merciful, took a son, the heavens shake. That's how offensive God describes it in the Qur'an. But that's God's perspective. And the Prophet and the companions are just human beings. His wrath cannot turn into what? Our wrath, we still have to deal with our neighbor with love. And what they believe, they believe that's between them and God, not between them and us. We don't, so God can pass judgments and He has the power to. He, does, he passes judgments in all revelation. Sure. You can disagree with those judgments and they may be up to discussion. But the fact that we don't have the authority to take that rage and convert it into ours, that's important. Because that to us is blasphemy. Because now you're saying, I share in God's control, in God's authority. Unfortunately, there are people who read God's word in other religions too. And they don't understand this very important point. They start drawing from the authority of God and start exacting that authority for themselves. It's a very tragic thing. And it leads to a lot of hateful speech. All right. Will do. So, we, when we study the Qur'an, we study it from the perspective of humble students, was my next point. We understand the Qur'an from the perspective of humble students, not from, position, not from a position of judging others. That's up to him. Let his revelation judge, let you, between you and him, you work that out. That's not my domain. That's not what I'm there for. Is there, does Islam preach respect for other faiths? A, 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 a funeral service was passing by and the Prophet was sitting. It was a Jewish girl who died. He stood up. When he stood up, the companion said, why are you standing? It's a Jewish girl. And he said, is she not a human? And he was teaching them. Is she not a child of Adam? And he stood up, and he made them stand, out of respect. The religion preaches, it teaches respect for others. It even teaches respect for people who, are, who act ignorantly, who act or, or say hateful things. A man shows up to the prophetic mosque. The, the, the Prophet's mosque now is one of the most grand structures and mo most revered you know, whole, uh, sacred sites for Muslims in the world. At the time the Prophet was still there, a man walks into the mosque, goes in a corner and starts urinating. In his presence. The companions get up and are about to tackle this guy. And he says, wait, let him finish. And the guy finishes. And he's walking away. And he pulled them to the side and said, my dear brother, this place is sacred, we pray here. It would be wise to not do such a thing here in the future. If you could. Nothing else. The guy became Muslim. Because there's a way to deal with others. Now, why, why am I sharing these stories with you? Because we're living in times of very low tolerance. <laughs> we're living in times of very, very low tolerance. The first thing needed is, when you want to understand someone else is you have to humanize them. You have to see them as a decent person. You have to see them as a fellow, you know, not just a fellow human being, in our case, even fellow citizens. People that have the same concerns, people that want the best for their neighborhood, their city, even their country. If you don't see them that way, there's no point in the in conversation because the preconceived notions can override any hopes of civil conversation. They override them, they undo them, you know. And so these are the f a few things that I, wanted to, I thought were priority in highlighting in our conversation today. Of course, Muslims pray five times a day. We fast in the month of Ramadan. We have this really, really cool ritual called the Hajj. I'd love to tell you all about it. It's the, it's the commemoration, it's the celebration of the legacy of Abraham and his sacrifice. Right? We all, I mean, those of you that come from Judeo-Christian backgrounds believe in Abraham and his sacrifice, of, of the many sacrifices he made for the sake of God. We have this yearly worldwide convention that celebrates his sacrifices. It's called Hajj. We go and we sacrifice animals in the millions and give them in charity in Mecca. We actually go around, if you've seen pictures of Mecca, that house we believe, believe was built by Abraham. The animals we sacrifice are actually a commemoration of the alternate sacrifice he made. We give, them, give the animals in charity. And then on top of that, 
you know, we pass by these three places and we pebble. There are three monuments and we pebble them. They're considered pebbling the devil. It actually commemorates that when he was taking his son for the sacrifice, the devil came to him three times and tried to stop him. And symbolically, he threw, devils, threw pebbles at the devil to shoo it away because was, he was going to make a sacrifice for the sake of God. And we actually, that's a part of our ritual at Hajj, at, 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 that, at that pilgrimage. So actually, Abraham is a really heavy figure in Islamic discourse. We're, we consider ourselves a very Abrahamic faith. Abraham is a very, very, very big deal. And Muhammad himself, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, is a descendant of Abraham from the line of Ishmael, which is another fun conversation. But anyway, but uh, the, uh, as, I, as I leave you, because in the next session, I'm going to talk to you guys about the Quran, and now I'll just take open questions from you guys. As I leave you, I just want to say, say one more thing. Most people don't know. The most talked about person in the Quran, the most talked about person in the Quran is Moses. Moses is a really big deal to us. He's a really big deal to us. And, by the way, uh, far more, and Muhammad, by the way, by name, is only mentioned four times in the whole book. Moses, there's over 70 passages about him. You know why I mentioned that? I mentioned that because a lot of people think Muslims are anti-Semitic. They hate Jews. Uh, Moses. We can't. The phrase sons of Israel, 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 we believe is a prophet. His other name is Yaqub, Jacob. He's a revered figure. The word itself, Bani Israel, sons of Israel, is a respected term in the Quran. He criticizes some among them for their behavior. That doesn't give anybody license to be anti-Semitic. And I, this is even a, a, a conversation with the Muslims in the audience who don't understand their book properly sometimes. This, it's not. And the more prophets from the Israelites are talked about in the Qur'an than any other. These are an honored people. God chose them. God gave them great honor by giving them many prophets and many revelations. And, a, and they are a huge chunk of our own sacred tradition. They became a necessary part of our sacred tradition. There's no way we can have hateful attitudes towards them as a people. However, what the Qur'an does do, and you might have read it too, it highlights certain bad behavior that some among them did. And the purpose of that is to leave an example, don't be like that. Don't do what those among them did. And here are the mistakes they made. You don't make those mistakes. That's the, that's the purpose of history in the Qur'an. Not to incite hate, but actually to teach lessons. Good role models and bad examples. Both. Learn lessons from the good examples and hear lessons from the bad. And actually some of the heroes mentioned in the Qur'an, non-prophets are also Israelites. Some non-prophetic heroes, believers who stood up for the right thing, no matter what, and you should learn from them, are actually Jews. They're talked about in the Quran. This is, this is in the text itself. I'm, I, I'm not making this up. I, I can cite it for you if you're interested in finding out where this stuff is. So that was a little bit of an overview. You are totally free to ask questions, uh, and hopefully they have to do with some things I talked about. But if not, you can just if you're curious about something else, and you, you'd like at least my perspective on it, I can share that with you. Yes. Sure. Um, I, I hear what you say about um, you know wanting to really devote your life to, to Allah and to be like a, a servant. And so um, um, my question, which has always been a question I had regarding Christianity too, is it almost makes God or Allah sound like a person that you have to serve. I'm trying to understand what is that purpose. I understand the good and you wanting to build your life and make you know to <coughs> other people and build something that lasts and all this stuff. And I do understand. Mm -hmm. But I don't understand it from the perspective that God or Allah expects that of you. And what is that? Why? Why is it that they sound like a human being wanting something? Ah, great question. So her question wasn't very loud, so I'll repeat it. But you know, when we talk about the expectations God has of us, it almost makes Him sound like a human being, like a human being having expectations. And a lot of the attributes we describe of Him, like love and you know, uh, uh, mercy and things like that. They seem like human attributes. And there are reasons for that. There, the first reason for that is actually that human qualities of love, mercy, you know, pursuit of knowledge, wisdom, justice, all of these things are actually inherent qualities in us that reflect what God gave us of Him. Because He put of His special, the special thing He created, the ruh, which is in English translated the soul, 
into us. Now, and it resonates with us. Now, we don't believe that God is a human or human-like, but we do believe in a personal God. In other words, a God that speaks to us, a God that loves, a God that wants, a God that even hates. He hates certain things. You know, the Prophet would tell us he likes three things, he hates three things. God hates three things. Like, you know, just hearing something and passing it on without verifying, he hates that, for instance. Right? So there is that personal relationship. It's not a philosophical entity of some kind of uni- divine being or unique, powerful being that's machine-like or you know, apersonal. It is a personal God that, in fact, we believe in. And that personhood of God where he you know, directly communicates with us and expresses his, his uh, expectations to us, and even I consider his love to us through his word, is it just pours out of the text. It pours out of when he speaks to us directly. And that, in the Qur'an session, I'll share some of that stuff with you. And I, I think that'll become clear. Sure? Um, me? Yeah, you and then you. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to read a... Uh, I'll stand up. Especially for the word of tolerance. Sure. This, is, this is a question to solve um, because it comes from a, from a Catholic background. Okay. As a former Catholic, <coughs> we know that there is a war authority that is called the Pope. Sure. My question, and I will, I will explain why I have a question, is if, if the masculine war has a worldwide leader. And the question is because of, when you mentioned the word uh, tolerance, that yes, there is, there is a lot of, uh, a lack of tolerance toward Islam. When I, when I hear the news, and when I read the news, and I hear, in this case, masculine people, behaving a certain way in some, some, uh, some countries in Africa, behaving a certain way in some, sometimes in the Middle East, and acting intolerant with other people from the same country who have different faiths. I mean, who is leading them? Um, you know what I mean? Um, it's not, of course, it's not a, a situation, a problem. It's a, it's a situation that happened before in the Christian world, especially in the Middle Ages. Right. Intolerance towards other people. Sure. My question, why is this happening? Well, I think uh, the, the postmodern context is a very difficult context for not just for religious groups, but for countries and nations. We're, we're, the world is recalibrated, right? And what religion meant 100 years ago is not what it means now. And the way that religious communities are organized, it actually also has a lot to do with the kind of stability a country enjoys or doesn't enjoy. So for instance, you'll find uh, at certain points there are massive riots in the Muslim world over some religious issue, right? And there are violence breaking out, cars being flipped over and burned, and all kinds of crazy stuff happening. And at the same time, you'll find some other countries, Muslim countries, where none of that's happening. And they're also very conservative, religious Muslim countries. And if you look at the differences between them, it's pretty interesting. It actually is directly correspondent to the number of educational institutions, infrastructure, transparency of government, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, when riots were happening in, uh, over you know, this, this YouTube video thing, if you remember a few, maybe almost a year ago now, right? Riots were happening in Libya, in Pakistan, and other, Bangladesh, all over the world, right? Turkey was calm, and Malaysia was calm, Indonesia was okay, there's no big deal, nothing. Why? Because, and they're also very Islamic governments. They're, they're very religious countries, but I think a lot of the chaotic situation actually has to do with a lack of education overall, not just religious, but lack of education, lack of economic opportunity, lack of infrastructure, you know, corrupt government uh, uh, institutions from the bottom up. So from the village, you have the village leader who sucks up all the money and the farmers are starving. And then from there on in the city governments and other, you know, it, it builds. And that kind of frustration, it's like people are ready to explode. You just need to give them a very small reason. And it just... It goes on fire. And this is really, and it's, it's continuously happening, right? It's continuously happening for this reason. Like the Arab Spring, that a lot of, there's a lot of talk about the Arab Spring, right? And what, what it means and how it's going on. Look, the undercurrents of the Arab Spring are not religious. The Arab, undercurrents of the Arab, Arab Spring are, you have dictatorial governments that have been economically suffocating their people for a long, long, long time. And things like freedom of speech, freedom of the press has been suffocated for a long, long time. There's only so much before it boils over. There's only so much. You know, in the Quran, we learn, interestingly, that the Pharaoh, who enslaved who? You guys should know this. The Pharaoh enslaved who? The Hebrews. The Hebrews. The Pharaoh in the Quran actually is deeply, in, deep inside, afraid of the Hebrews. And 
like, what? He's enslaved them. He's got them on lockdown. He can slaughter them when he wants. Ah, but he's afraid of an uprising. Mm. He's afraid of an uprising. The people you oppress the most are the people you're scared of the most, actually. Mm. Right? Yeah, so that's on the, on the political front, but that, that does make for some pretty interesting conversation. I'll take a written question, and then I'll take your question. So, so there was a question. <clears throat> Is it true that you pray to both evil angel and God angels? So why would you pray to evil in your faith? Uh, do you believe God is a schemer? No, uh, we don't believe. We don't pray to angels, and we don't actually believe there are such a thing as evil angels. Also, and we don't. We certainly don't pray to angels. Uh, we believe angels are, are servants of God, in some sense, like we are, mm -hmm. and they carry out God's commandments. So we don't pray to them. The only one we rely on and pray to is God Himself. Do we believe God is a schemer? The Quran's response to that actually is wa makaru wa makar Allah wa Allahu khairu makirin. It's beautiful. He says people who who scheme evil make their plots, and Allah makes a plot to undo all of their plots. So we, we learn in the Quran on multiple occasions that God does extensively and secretly plan and plan against enemies. That's only when they have an elaborate plan. Mm. You know, and then at the end of it, he says, "Allah is the best and God is the best of all planners." Um, at one time, Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived in peace, harmony, as uh, readers from the book. When was this? What happened? Uh, well, it wasn't that long ago. I mean, I have one of my teachers is Palestinian. Uh, he comes in back and forth from the to the U.S. He teaches both, and he goes back. He's about sixty years old, so he's actually he was living in uh, Jerusalem pre-occupation. So before the Israeli occupation, he was living there. And his neighbors were Jewish and Christian. And they got together for, for tea every morning. Then the bell rang for the church. And then the, the Christian friend would go pray there. And the Jewish friend would go to the synagogue and pray. And they'd go, he'd go to the mosque and they'd come back and play chess together. And they, this was the life. I mean, can, can you imagine? This seems like a, some hypothetical, crazy fantasy world where Muslims, Jews, and Christians were hanging out with each other in the Arab world. Are you insane? Yeah, this was actually happening in 60 years, 60 years ago. This, this, is, this was our world. This is not some pre, like, ancient times that are long gone. And if it happened then, it can happen now. It can. It's just, we are, we think these things have become so difficult, and I honestly think it's a direct result of alienation. People don't actually talk to each other. People don't talk to each other. And it, it, we, you'd be surprised how many barriers that breaks. Anyway, so yeah, what happened was <coughs> stuff. <laughs> um, how do Muslims or Islam view homosexuality? It's a good question. Um, why do you pray five times per day? Shouldn't people pray simultaneously? I'll address both of these, okay? So why do we pray five times a day? We actually pray at least five times a day, and we pray spontaneously all the time. That hopefully answers that question. So you you got to meet a minimum requirement, okay? You meet a minimum requirement. You show up, you know, and you you report back to God after a few hours and say, "Hey, Lord, I did this," and you recite His revelation. Stand in front of Him, drop everything else, refuel like a car, then go back out there, then engage the world. And a few hours later, come back, talk to Him again, drop everything else, refuel, go do it again. So that's five times a day. Um, and we do, as a matter of fact, pray spontaneously all the time, all the time. And on top of the spontaneous prayers, we have even upper, like uh, uh, situational prayers, a prayer to enter the mosque, to leave the mosque, a prayer to go into the bathroom to seek refuge from filth, a prayer when you leave the bathroom to, to thank God for leaving your body and what would have been harmful to it. Just we utter words, special words for occasions, just to remind ourselves. They're, they're prophetic prayers for beginning to beginning your food and finishing your food, putting clothes on, buying new clothes, entering into a store, walking out of a store, going to work, getting in your car, getting out of your car. They keep coming. So many questions. Okay. So what was the other thing? Homosexuality. Islam believes, or Islam gave us the right, Muslims the right, to judge behavior, but not people. Who gets to judge people? Yeah. Allah does. That's it. Done deal. He says, our revelation believes homosexuality, the act itself, the final act itself is wrong. The tendency itself, the Quran is silent on. It didn't give a position on, well, if somebody has those feelings, 
and somebody has that thought, and they're fighting that urge, et cetera, et cetera, then actually, historically in Islam, there have been counseling thousands, of, even a thousand years ago, there were people who reported to have those feelings, and they, they, they were given the counsel to fight their urges, but not engage in the act itself. The act itself is considered evil, and it's considered the same as uh, fornication, you know, uh, an act outside of marriage. So Islam has a pretty strong stance on that too. That is not to say that if somebody, a homosexual sitting in the audience, that I'm going to judge them. I don't have any license to. I have no such license. And that's really that, that line that so many people fail to draw. So many people fail to draw. Look, the, the, and there are things Islam says, you know, many Muslims, for example, in the United States aren't very practicing. Right? They don't really practice a lot of the regulations I talked about. The few of them, they don't practice them. But that doesn't change the fact that those are the regulations. So if I was asked to talk about Islamic regulations, I wouldn't say, well, maybe I shouldn't talk about this to a crowd that's not that practicing, they might find it offensive. No, you can do what you want. That's not my business. My business is to tell you what it says. You decide what you do with that. That's not me, you know? But that, that is its stance. We do, we, we do, we do not condone uh, homosex the homosexual act itself. Um, and it's talked about in the nation of the nation of Lot is mentioned in the Quran, uh, and that discourse with the angels, that story. I think the, the, the biblical narrative is there too. That is in the Quran. Um, sure. Uh, please provide citation of Beautify This World that you mentioned earlier, Surah number seven. Surah number seven, first two pages somewhere. I don't. I'm not Google, but I can pull it up for you if you come to me after the break. Uh, could you elaborate on your understanding of evil? Where do you believe evil comes from and what do you understand Satan to be? Satan is a jinn. Jinn, there are three kinds of creatures that have choice. Uh, human beings, angels, and jinn. Jinn, we believe, are made of smokeless fire. Uh, we believe that Satan was a jinn. The difference between uh, angels and the rest is that angels obey God unconditionally. They are creatures of light and they obey God unconditionally. Satan was originally a jinn who believed in God and worshipped him in our, in our tradition. And worshipped him so much willingly that he was even given a rank above angels. So he commanded an army of angels, even though he himself wasn't one. Then finally, the, the, the fateful day comes, Adam is created, the soul is blown into him, the angels are commanded to prostrate. He refuses. And he refuses in our creed because Kana min al jinn, he was from among the jinn, not among the angels. And so he made the choice to disobey. Now he then, from then on, commands an army of two, an army of jinns. Not all. Some jinns are Muslims. Some jinns accept the faith, because they are creatures of choice also. And an army of people who don't even know he's controlling them. So he's got two that work with him, that are both talked about in the Quran. We believe that uh, about evil, it's not something that's talked about in the Quran as an, an well, separate entity. But we do say we don't attribute evil to God ever. In the next session I'll talk to you about how, how the Quran talks about evil and I think it will highlight our stance on evil a lot better. Um, I talked about the real thing as well. That's good. Is your God Allah considered a loving God? You can answer that for me? Can you answer that for me? Yes. Why? Where do you get that from? Because from the word I gave you in your notes that like one of you wrote down, what was that word? Uh, ilah. ilah. The word ilah, which we is uh, the Arabic word for God, actually includes obsessive love and the object of love. And love itself is included in the meaning. And that's not some meaning that you'll find in the modern dictionary, as a matter of fact. That's the classical Arabic meaning of the word. Aliha ilah fulan, to be obsessively loved be in love with someone and to incline towards them. Um, is your God considered a loving God or a mean, angry God, as in he punishes people for their sins? He, oh, one of my favorite quotes from the Quran, oh, you're going to love this one. I don't know if you're going to love this one. I love this one. Ma yaf'alullahu bi'adabikum. He says, what's God going to get out of punishing you anyway? I love that one. Another place he says, you know, إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ رَبُّكْ وَلِذَلِكَ خَلَقَهُمْ The ones, except he's talking about, you know, uh, uh, people that were, you know, obsessively uh, disobedient and rebellion against him. And he goes, 
that he, his justice might come to them, except the ones who he shows love and mercy to. Wali ذَلِكَ خَلَقَهُمْ means, and that is why he created them to begin with. In other words, he created them to show them love. <coughs> the purpose of human beings, one of, its, one of their purposes, on the one hand, turn to me in slavery, on the other, so I can show you love and mercy. It's the function. You know, God, God is not out to destroy people, or to throw them in hell and fill, them, fill hellfire with them. And, you know, this, this fire needs some fuel. It's not like that. One of the most favorite, my favorite traditions of the Prophet. Oh, this one's awesome. They, we believe heaven has levels. Seven heavens. Okay, there are seven levels of paradise, of heaven. So when people go to heaven, good people, economy class heaven, then there's like deluxe premium, and the, you know, there's the elite golden package, platinum, whatever, you know? There's the seventh heaven. And the Prophet would describe the distance between the first and the seventh, first and the second heaven is like the distance between the earth and the stars. So they're far ways apart, right? And of course you would imagine the highest kind of heaven would be for what kind of people? Like super awesome people, in other words, not myself. Like these must be some really, really good people that are up in where? The seventh heaven, the highest heaven there is. The Prophet tells us that God built a house in the seventh heaven for every human being on this earth. He built a house on the seventh heaven for every human being since Adam. Some people didn't want to go. Some people just refused. The house is waiting to go. You know what that tells you? What that tells you is God has an expectation that you'll make it. He, he's already signed you on, not signed you off. You know how some teachers write you off? Sometimes parents write their kids off. He's not written us off. He, you don't build a house for someone if you don't expect them to show up. He built it. It's waiting. It's waiting. So we don't even aspire for the lowest. We aspire for the highest. Yeah. So is there any concept of purgatory? No. But there's a temporary place in, on Judgment Day called Ashabul A'raf. The Heights. It's called the seventh chapter. begins with that. It's a brief reference to that. Which means on Judgment Day there are people whose deeds are weighed and their forgiveness and all of that. And some people yeah, end up exactly at middle. Just enough good, just enough bad, and the scales are even, and they're not flipping to either side. And they're on top of these heights, and they can see hell on the one side and heaven on the other. And then they pray to God, and then Allah, mm. heaven. Oh, yeah. Sorry, going back to the question that someone asked about uh, the angels and the angels, you said, That's right. It commands uh, other jinns. Right. Um, so angels are, are good beings of light that obey God's every command. That's right. Do you not believe, um, I guess you would say, like in demons or are the jinns? The closest thing to demons bad? would be jinns. So they're kind of like, would you believe or would you say there are like bad, unseen things that can move in our lives? Sure. Um, sure. Jinns. Yeah. Okay, sure. So we also believe that they don't have power over us. We believe they, will, they can take control, they can. they can, but if we grant them that. Exactly. And we, we also believe that people who resort to like uh, trinkets and like, uh, you know, symbols and turn to other things for protection, like people put some things around their neck, amulets, you know, what that does, this is exactly what they want. They want you to look for protection in something other than the unseen God himself. That's what we believe. So it's when you seek his refuge, you're safe. When you start seeking refuge in anything else, any object, you know, once I put this scarf on, I'll be okay, or once I pour this on myself, I'll be fine, etc., etc. then you've attributed protection to something other than God. And that's what they wanted to begin with. That's what they wanted, yeah. So I have, uh, in my home above the door, I have uh, a crucifix with the corpus on it. That was my great-grandmother. I don't uh, pray to that um, when I pray, uh, but I mean, um, I'm not attributing any, any power to that. It's just a reminder to me. Uh, so that goes back to the intention, doesn't it? When, when something's a reminder, it's just a reminder. When something's there and you look at it and you say, thank God it's there, it's protecting the house, then it's a problem. So it's, it's a matter of, you could, you, two people could be doing the same exact thing, but their intentions are what changes everything. Right? So it's, and our, our faith, by the way, intentions are everything. 
all matters, all, all things you do are based on the intentions you carry them with. The, uh, nothing else has value but the intention behind it. Yeah. And we'll let that be the final word as we break for lunch. Thank right. you so much, Lisa Noah.